For the last three days, I've been providing reports, or at least relaying reports, about um, a renewed Russian advances right across the contact line and a particularly uh, disastrous situation for the Ukrainians in Avdeyevka. I've also been saying that the reports were just reports. The sit situation appeared to be very confusing. It was difficult sometimes to get an actually stable idea of what was in fact really happening in Avdeyevka. But early this morning, we began to get confirmation and it appears to confirm the worst possible news for the um, situation of the Ukrainian defenders in Avdeyevka. Um, we've had the first video film, which shows the presence of Russian troops in Avdeyevka itself. The video shows the Russians in the furthest point which Russian sources had claimed the Russians had reached in terms of their advance, and it in effect confirms all of the reports that we've been getting about the Russian advance in Avdeyevka, in the southern eastern areas of Avdeyevka. You can see this video, if you wish, um, in the latest program video that has been done by Dima at the Military Summary Channel. And it is now clear that Ukrainian resistance in the southern part of Avdeyevka is in the process of collapsing. Yesterday, I saw a report that the Russians had actually reached the center of Avdeyevka. I think that is probably premature, but the pace of the Russian advance in southern Avdeyevka is astonishing. And it is also the case that very heavy fortified positions, fortified positions which earlier in the war, the Ukrainians might have been expected to be able to defend for many weeks, appear to be collapsing one after the other extremely fast. In uh, one particular case, a place known as Tsar Hunt, Tsar Ahotka, um, this is a... Um, Apparently, originally, it was a leisure resort. It was turned, transformed by the Ukrainians into a very heavy fortified area. There was a lot of talk about what a strong position this was. It appears to have been assaulted by the Russians, perhaps three or four days ago, and to have collapsed within a few hours. Now, what explains this, the speed of this collapse? Well, I think the first thing to say is that obviously the Russians have a, concentrated a very large force in and around Avdeyevka itself. Uh, there are reports that there are around 40,000 Russian troops besieging Avdeyevka. Obviously, they're not all in one place. Many of them are fighting further north along the railway towards Ocheritenye and in um, um, Stepovoye and towards Berdichi. Others are fighting further to the southwest in this other village of Pervomaisky. More troops are attacking the Ukrainian positions near the famous coke and chemical plants in the north. By the way, there appear to be advances by the Russians in all of these places as well, though the most dramatic attacks have happened in the south. But anyway, there are a lot of Russian troops fighting around Avdeyevka, and these troops clearly are heavily equipped, and they are steadily reinforced, and they have a large amount of artillery and ammunition and tanks and other things in their possession. So clearly the Russians, the Russian ground forces, are very strong and by all appearances very determined. And that's why they're able to push forward so fast. But I'm going to suggest that there are three other reasons which explain the speed of this attack. And by the way, and it's a point I've made earlier in other videos that I've done, well, starting some months ago, actually, 
But contrary to what a lot of people have been saying, as far as I can see, this battle of Avdeevka has actually been going not slowly, but very fast. Given how, or, 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 or fairly fast, given how heavily fortified Avdeevka has, was supposed to be. And, I mean, it actually was heavily fortified. Um, Patrick Lancaster, the um, intrepid Canadian reporter, has been close to Avdeevka earlier, at earlier periods in the war. He's talked about the very elaborate fortifications that the Ukrainians created around Avdeevka, the drone systems, the minefields, the um, fortified barriers, the trenches, the CCTV cameras that are able to monitor positions. He spoke about all of this and about the heavy fire that the Ukrainians were able to concentrate on any position um, around Avdeevka that appeared to be coming under attack. So this is a very heavy fortified place near Donetsk city itself. It was a linchpin of the Ukrainian positions around Donetsk city. In fact, it was the most important position of the Ukrainian forces close to Donetsk city. A Western journalist spoke of Avdeevka as a dagger pointed, pointing at the heart of Donetsk city itself, which is a suggestive um, description given the relentless shelling of Donetsk city that Ukraine has been engaged in since 2014, which, by the way, um, continued last night. I will come back to that later. But anyway, um, given how important Avdevka was in maintaining a Ukrainian presence near Donetsk city, given that, in effect, it is the linchpin to the Ukrainian siege of Donetsk city, which has been underway since 2014, given also that it's a key part of the Ukrainian defence system in Donbass, and given that the Ukrainians have had seven years to develop the fortification system around Avdeevka, to me, contrary to some claims that one reads in the Western media, this Russian operation overall has been progressing quite fast. But what explains this latest collapse, as I said, despite these elaborate fortifications, apart from the fact that there are so many Russian troops now engaged in this operation around Avdeevka itself. When I say lots of Russian troops, bear in mind that the population of Avdeevka before the war, before the conflict began in 2014, was put at 30,000. So there's 40,000 Russian troops besieging Avdeevka. That is a larger, greater number of troops than the pre-war population of Avdeevka itself. Well, what explains this rapid collapse? It seems to me that there are three factors. The first, and we go back to the comment made by Mr. Barabash a couple of days ago, the civilian administrator, Ukrainian civil administrator of Avdeevka. He has spoken about the fact that the supply lines to Avdeevka are in the process of being cut by the Russians, that uh, the Russians have, in effect, established fire control over them. It's very difficult to send supplies and reinforcements into Avdeevka itself to keep the troops, the Ukrainian troops there, supplied with food and ammunition and equipment and all that kind of thing. Well, um, we've had some confirmation of that also. I spoke some about two weeks ago about a rather distressing event of how some Ukrainian soldiers in Avdeevka, I think it was around 100 of them, had been granted leave, Christmas leave, and had um, been, um, had gone on to the coaches and had tried to leave Avdeevka to rejoin their families. And it seemed that somewhere along the way, those coaches were attacked by Russian drones or artillery. And it seems that none of the 
none of these Ukrainian soldiers, in the end, was able to get through. So that tells us how difficult the supply situation in Avdevka is. And, of course, that is having an effect on the defences. It means that Ukrainian troops in Avdevka are running short of ammunition and other supplies, and that must be making it more difficult for them to keep their defence going. They are not completely trapped. It is still possible for Ukrainians, Ukrainian troops to go in and out of Avdevka. If we believe Ukrainian reports, no less a person than President Zelensky was able to visit Avdevka himself about two weeks ago. There's been some doubts about that uh, circulating on Russian or pro-Russian channels. I'm not sure. I'm prepared to believe that he did go. Of course, the situation could have deteriorated since he was there. But anyway, it's not a watertight siege, but it's probably enough to cause Ukrainian supplies uh, to dwindle. The other factor, and this is now being confirmed by many reports, I'd sort of guessed that it might be the case before, is that the Ukrainian defences in Avdevka are short of men. Um, there's only one brigade holding the positions in the central and southern parts of Avdevka. This is the 110th Brigade. Another brigade, the 57th, is located somewhere to the north. Both of these brigades will have suffered heavy losses over the last uh, couple of weeks and months of fighting. Reinforcements have been sent. I'm not saying they're the only Ukrainian units in Avdevka itself, but they are clearly the core of the Ukrainian defences. And by now, the numbers of troops in these two brigades must have reduced substantially. I'm not going to try and guess how many troops the Ukrainians still have in Avdevka, but it's clear that it is not enough to hold all the positions in Avdevka itself. And by the way, on that topic, there's been reports now starting to appear in the Ukrainian uh, uh, parts of the internet that because Ukraine in general is so short of men, the military in Ukraine is so short of men, these reports are again saying that Ukraine may be obliged to withdraw from certain positions along the contact line. And it seems to me that the sudden flurry of comments about this that you're starting to see again from Ukrainian uh, channels. Um, we've heard that before, but as I said, it suddenly resumed. Maybe because it's becoming difficult to dispute the fact that there are these shortages of men um, in Avdevka itself and that the contact line is not being held properly. Well, that's, that's the second reason. So fewer supplies, too few men to hold all the positions when the Russians are attacking Avdevka from multiple directions at once, as it appears that they are. And the third reason is Russian bombing. Now, in earlier phases of the war, the big story has been Russian shelling in the uh, Severodonetsk Lysychansk battles in the summer of 2022. It was the enormous shelling, the enormous weight of shelling that the Russians were engaging in, um, that was the big story. The same was true during the Bakhmut fighting. This time in Avdeevka, the Russian Air Force has also been very busy. And in fact, over the last week or so, there have been many pictures showing Russian fighter bombers, Suhoi 25s, um, flying over Avdevka, apparently at will, bombing Ukrainian positions. And 
it seems that the Russians have also been launching, um, presumably from larger and more powerful aircraft, Suhoi 34s and 35s, uh, their big precision guided fab bombs, 500 kilos, 1,500 kilos in some cases. There's also, by the way, pictures that have started to appear of a new bomb, precision guided bomb, that the Russians have apparently developed and apparently about to start using on the battlefronts. This is a thermobaric bomb, fuel air explosive bomb, very similar to the, in philosophy, to the TOS multiple launch rocket system that the Russians use. Um, these are devastating weapons, and these fuel air explosive or thermobaric bombs would be absolutely deadly if used against trenches. And the Ukrainian defense lines, of course, rely heavily on trenches, as, by the way, the Russian defense lines also did. These would be far more devastating if used against trenches than, say, cluster munitions were. Those cluster munitions that the United States supplied to Ukraine last summer at the time of Ukraine's offensive. Anyway, the point is that, as I remember, way back in the autumn of 2022, one of the extremely helpful people who writes to me, again, I'm not going to disclose details of him, except I will say that he comes from India. Um, anyway, he pointed out that um, in order to destroy fortifications, big fortified lines, artillery can certainly do damage, but rapid destruction of fortified positions is best achieved with heavy bombs. And I suspect that this is what the Russians were doing. We, as I said, we were getting all those reports a couple of days ago of very heavy Russian bombing, aerial bombing of Avdevka. And it is clear that what the Russians were doing was demolishing the fortifications in places like Tsar's Hunt and other places. So we have all of these reasons coming together and creating a crisis, an operational crisis for the Ukrainians in Avdevka. And what we hear, what we see, um, and as I said, there's now visual confirmation of this, Ukrainian defense is collapsing. The Russians outnumbering U the Ukrainians in Avdevka probably by a very significant margin, obviously much better equipped and supplied than the Ukrainians who are at the end of what is now a very tenuous supply line indeed, and the Russians also able to bomb Ukrainian positions, which they were not able to do to the same extent earlier in the war. This, by the way, providing further confirmation of the Russian success over the course of 2023 in suppressing Ukraine's air defense system and air force, and also the revolutionary impact on the battlefield of the, Ukra of the Russians' development of these precision-guided aerial bombs. By the way, on the topic of aerial bombs, President Macron of France, in response to all of the criticism that he's coming under from the Russians, I discussed all this yesterday in an extensive segment of my previous video, the fact that the attack on the French on the French uh, so-called mercenaries in the um, in the hotel in Kharkiv appears to have been a rather more significant event than appeared on the surface. And it did seem as if the French government and its um, security agencies and defense officials were probably involved in some way. Anyway, President Macron announced as part of the package of support that France is giving to Ukraine, clearly by way of defiance to these Russian warnings, that France is now going to supply 50 
precision guided aerial bombs to Ukraine each month. And Dima at the Military Summary Channel pointed out that the Russians are now using around 150, or I think he said actually 130, precision guided aerial bombs in Ukraine a day. So that gives us the a sense of the difference. Um, on that issue, by the way, I suspect that we are still at an early point in the Russian bombing war. I suspect that Russian production of aerial, precision guided aerial bombs is going to increase or probably is increasing substantially. Um, the number of bombs the Russians are dropping on Ukrainian positions so far is only a fraction of what, say, the Israelis have been doing in Gaza and the Middle East, or what the US routinely does in its various wars. And I suspect that before long, or over the course of the next few weeks and months, we'll be seeing the Russians cranking out more bombs and engaging in more airstrikes of this kind, inflicting much more damage on the Ukrainians. Anyway, one way or the other, whatever the reasons, a major operational crisis for the Ukrainians in Avdeevka, a collapse in Avdeevka, and all of this coming alongside further very bad news for Ukraine right across the battlefronts. Now, there was a report this morning, again, I can't confirm it, but it seems consistent with the information that we've been getting uh, over the last couple of days, that the number of Ukrainian troops still um, resisting in Krinki has now fallen to 50. This is the bridgehead on the east bank of the Dnieper River. Apparently something like another 30 or to 35 have been killed over the last couple of days, killed or wounded by the Russians over the last couple of days. This is this, this bridgehead is in a condition now of rapid collapse. And as I've said already uh, in previous videos, many times now, the only humane thing to do, or so it seems to me, by the Ukrainian command is to order those men in Krinki, those few surviving men in Krinki, to surrender to the Russians. And if they don't get that order, I think they should take that decision and surrender themselves. They're from Marine Brigades, apparently. They're highly motivated soldiers. I understand why some of them may have issues of pride. But what are they achieving by dying in Krinki in a battle, this battle for Krinki? which multiple Ukrainian and Western sources are now openly admitting was misconceived from the start. But Klinky of Devka are not the only places where um, Ukraine is now suffering problems. Now, we have not heard much news about what is going on in the Marinka area. There were reports yesterday that the Russians are continuing to push forward in uh, Georgievka. This is the village to the west of Marinka. There's been less news about this and less news about Novomikhailovka. I suspect that this is not because there's been any slackening of the Russian push in either of these places. Rather, it is because the uh, news from Av Avdeevka is monopolizing all the attention. But it does seem that the Russians are now making significant further progress in, um, not in, in the Bakhmut area. They appear to be pushing hard and towards the village of Ivanivska, to the southwest of um, Bakhmut. This is, of course, a village that the Wagner organization was never able to capture. The Russians call it Krasnoye, by the way. But anyway, the Russians now seem to be within striking distance of this village. But more importantly, or perhaps, I'm not sure what it is more important, but anyway, more demonstratively, they appear to be in the 
process now of collapsing Ukrainian resistance in the other village, Bogdanovka, to the northwest of Bakhmut. And apparently there have been Russian troops have now apparently, or there's been reports, I've never seen any pictures, but there's been some reports that the Russians have now uh, raised their flag in the center of Bogdanovka. This is a large village, so even if the Russians have done that, it doesn't mean that the entire village is under Russian control, but it does seem to be progressively becoming so. And we've had another of these very upsetting videos that Ukrainian soldiers, without presumably authorization, release. And this one is from some of the Ukrainian defenders in Bogdanovka. They show themselves in a dugout. They're speaking of hellish conditions again. They say that most of them are sick with various conditions because of the difficult weather. And, well, again, I'm not going to discuss the content of the video, but apparently it does suggest that the situation of the Ukrainian troops defending Bogdanovka is becoming extremely bad. And further north... Kupiansk, Liman, all the reports again of the Russians launching further advances. They captured a village on a, uh, on a road. Um, there's been a lot of attention about this. It's been mentioned even in the Western media have conceded this. There's lots of photos of the Russians having captured this particular village. All their flags are there. And one gets a sense of a major Russian advance pushing forward towards the Oskol River. And this is to the south of Kupiansk, but it does appear to be part of a general operation to finally bring this battle for Kupiansk to an end, with Russian troops also supposedly advancing north of Stepovoye as well. And again, as the Russian Ministry of Defense are now prolifically reporting, there's lots of pictures of this, Russian helicopter gunships, Karma 52s, are very active now in this area as well. They appear to be attacking Ukrainian military units in various places, trying to defend Kupiansk. And there's also reports that Russian drone activity is very active and Precision-guided bombs are also being dropped by Russian air aircraft. So again, we see the Russian Air Force starting to exert pressure on the battlefield. So a deteriorating situation for the Ukrainians in the northern sector around Kupians. I suspect that this part of the uh, battle lines. There's some reports that the Russians have very heavily reinforced their forces around Kupians, that the largest concentration of Russian troops, actually, up to 150,000, according to some reports, is in, is in this area. I think that's an exaggeration, by the way. But anyway, that the largest concentration of Russian forces on the, nor on the contact line is in fact, located around Kupiansk, and that it is now being activated and is now receiving air support and is engaging in these big advances. The second biggest concentration, around 80,000 men, if you believe Ukrainian claims, is around Bakhmut, and they're pushing hard westwards as well. And the third biggest concentration, 40,000 men, is around Avdevka, and I'm not saying the battle for Abdevka is ending. Probably there's still quite a lot of fighting still to go. But as I discussed earlier in the program, the situation for the Ukrainians in Avdevka has been very bad. Now, two days ago, more reports were circulating of major Russian drone attacks, Terranium 2 drone attacks, right across um, Ukraine. There are some reports early today that the Russians are also in the process of cranking up 
for another big missile strike. Apparently there's been an air raid alarm right across Ukraine. Well, we'll see whether that happens and what it all means if it does actually happen. Anyway, major operational crisis for Ukraine. And we are now getting more rumours that the situation in Kiev is becoming extremely tense politically. And there were reports yesterday that President Zelensky has formally dismissed General Zaluzhny, the overall military commander, from his post and has appointed Kirill Budanov, the intelligence chief, to take his place. And the reason for that, supposedly, the reason it's been given is the collapse of the defences in Avdevka. And anyway, as we know, um, Zelensky and Zeluzhny have been sniping at each other. Well, in fact, not sniping. They've been engaging in open um, arguments and disputes now for several weeks, ever since the um, failure of Ukraine's summer offensive. And to say it frankly, it's also clear that there have been that there's been tensions between the two men pretty much from the moment that Zeluzhny was appointed to his position as overall military commander. If my memory serves me rightly, I think it was around May or June 2022. But anyway, there we go. So reports, and I want to stress at the moment, they are only reports that Zeluzhny has been sacked, formally sacked, and that Budanov has been put in charge. And the reason for that is the events in Avdevka, but also most probably the overall deteriorating or rapidly deteriorating situation on the battlefronts. And as I have pointed out previously, Budanov, if he is being appointed to this role, he is not a person with command experience. He's never had command experience of troops. He is a former Special Forces of officer or soldier, as discussed in a lengthy interview, which, perhaps not coincidentally, we will come to that in a moment, has now appeared in the Financial Times. Now, before... I discussed the content and purpose of this interview. Um, I'd just like to draw attention to this particular paragraph which appears in this Financial Times article. It describes Budanov in this way. A former Special Forces soldier who fought in the Donbass in 2014, Budanov has himself taken part in secret missions, including in the occupied Crimean Peninsula. Of course, the Financial Times, as The Guardian, as The Times, as pretty much the entire British media, invariably, when talking about Crimea, talks about Crimea as occupied Crimea. The people of Crimea would certainly, I'm sure, the great majority of them, strongly dispute that. But anyway, that's the standard language that the British media adopts. And anyway, I, I'm not going to say more about it now. But then we come to the interesting point part of this paragraph. His, which is to say Budanev's, body bears the scars. Shrapnel from an anti-personnel mine once struck near his heart, nearly killing him. He has broken both his neck and back, and he has been shot in the arm. Notice that the Financial Times doesn't tell us when any of these wounds happened. Now, a couple of months ago, there were a lot of reports that Budanov had been badly wounded in a Russian missile attack on the headquarters of Ukrainian military intelligence in Kiev. And I remember that the reports that he'd been rushed to Germany and had received medical treatment there. And it was certainly the case that he did disappear 
for quite a long time before he subsequently reappeared. Now, shrapnel from an anti-personnel mine once struck near his heart, nearly killing him. Presumably that is an earlier incident or a different incident. But when exactly did he break both his neck and back? Could that have been during this incident as part of that missile strike? Just asking. I don't know. One way or the other, um, probably we will never be told. But anyway, just, just, just to say. Anyway, what is the purpose of this article in the Financial Times and why has it appeared now? Well, I'm going to suggest that the purpose of this article in the Financial Times is or could be to introduce Budanov to the Western readership, the Western elite readership that reads the Financial Times as the new commander of Ukraine's ground forces taking over as General Zeluzhny. We've just had these rumours circulating in Kiev that Zeluzhny has been sacked and that Budanov has taken his place and Budanov suddenly is giving this big interview to the Financial Times. And as I said, I don't think this is a coincidence. We will see what happens in Kiev over the next couple of hours, whether um, Zeluzhny's dismissal is confirmed and Budanov's appointment is confirmed. Maybe it won't be. Maybe Zeluzhny and his people will push back, as they have done before. Um, who knows? <laughs> but anyway, we have all of these rumours circulating in Kiev. We have this long article. It's an interview with him in the Financial Times. Clearly, the, clearly this isn't a coincidence, or at least it doesn't look to me to be a coincidence. And... I'm not going to read the article, but we're told that Budanov enjoys cult status amongst Ukrainians. Well, maybe he does. Maybe he does amongst some Ukrainians. But I wonder whether all Ukrainians quite share this admiration for him. Uh, we're told that it all comes at a cost, that um, he moves with an entourage of bodyguards and intelligence agents of the many assassination attempts against him. The closest call came in 2019 when a bomb placed beneath his vehicle exploded prematurely. Anyway, by the way, that was not the incident where he broke his neck and back because we're told that he was uninjured. He wasn't in the vehicle at the time. Well, who knows? Um, the incident... The article confirms that his wife, Mariana Budanova, uh, was less fortunate. She was intentionally poisoned with heavy metals in November, along with several good officers, according to the good being Ukrainian military intelligence. And Budanov has now formally confirmed that this incident did take place, and he says that she's getting treatment. She feels better now. And he declined to elaborate whether he or his wife was the intended target of the po of the poisoning. And um, anyway, there we go. So uh, it's clear that uh, Mariana Budanov, Budanova, his wife, was indeed poisoned, as the reports said. Um, the implication of the Financial Times article is that this was the Russians who were behind it, and perhaps they were. But of course, as I pointed out at the time, this was all happening at a time when all kinds of other incidents were taking place in Kiev, when one of, um, just shortly after, one of Zeluzhny's aides was killed in a grenade attack, very mysterious one, supposed to have happened on his birthday, when he, allegedly he pulled the pin of a grenade out of the grenade, thinking it was some kind of a present. 
it's all very strange. And it did seem to me, and I still believe, by the way, that more likely Maria, uh, Budanova, Maria Bud Mariana Budanova's poisoning was connected with that event in some way and pointed to internecine conflicts within the Ukrainian political and military leadership. I want to stress that, again, my um, supposition, obviously, I don't have corroboration of that, but we're each entitled, all of us are entitled to our views. But then, of course, he goes on to say that um, the situation on the battlefronts is so bad, things are not Things are difficult. This is in the Financial Times article, but they're not desperate. Um, um, he also is commended by the Financial Times for having revitalized military intelligence in Ukraine, which long played second fiddle to Ukraine's much larger domestic security service, the SBU. I think that's, by the way, the first reference to the SBU that I've ever seen in any article in the Financial Times, but I am not going to swear to that. I might be wrong. And of course, it's always possible that other articles have appeared, which also refer to the SBU, which I might have missed. But anyway, there we go. And um, we also says that uh, the Financial Times article tells us that he's reluctant to offer an assessment of Ukraine's currently, currently current military operations, deferring to the army's general staff. And of course, if he's going to be appointed chief of the general staff, he'll be able to do so. And he said, and then we are told um, that um, there has to be another mobilization. It is not even conceivable that we can do without mobilization. The shortage of manpower is palpable. And then there's a um, brief discussion um, about why his previous predictions that Ukraine would capture Crimea as a result of the summer offensive failed to come true. And of course, Budanov says that, well, you know, things didn't quite turn out exactly as we thought. Um, the original plans suggested something different. We kept our promise. We did actually get to Crimea. Our, this summer, our units repeatedly entered Crimea. And this, of course, as the Financial Times grudgingly has to admit, refers to Budanov's commandos sneaking onto the peninsula to carry out raids on Russian bases. Raids, by the way, which produced nothing, achieved nothing of any significance. And then Budanov indulges again in his usual fantasy spins. He says that the Russians are using more weapons and munitions than they are able to make. I've already discussed Russian equipment production, that is clearly not the case. And he also says that the Russians are facing a shortage of manpower. Um, um, he um, says that uh, the Russians are unable to recruit more troops than they lose. Again, I don't think anybody who's been following the war closely, actually believes that. And he talks a bit about, um, about uh, the Wagner organization, which he says does still exist. And he also discusses what even the Financial Times admits is a personal hobby horse of Budanov, um, Putin's health, and he continues to insist that um, Putin is ill, apparently with cancer, and that the people we see um, appearing to be Putin on Russian television are various clones. And then um, he goes on to say that, well, he's not prepared to make bold predictions for what will happen 
in, 1990, in 2024. He says that, our, I hope that our success will be greater than theirs. And then we're told that he slipped out of the darkened room, which is a very interesting uh, thing to say. And in fact, we have the picture. And indeed, the room does appear to be very dark. And we're told that he likes the darkness, which, well, it is suggestive of something. I mean, why does he keep his office dark? Is it because he's suffering from a health condition? Migraines, perhaps? Uh, as someone who suffers from migraines, I can say that sometimes working or resting in a darkened room does indeed help you cope with migraines? Um, are the migraines the product of his various injuries? Or is it perhaps that he's trying to keep his room dark because um, he doesn't, he's concerned about um, monitoring devices, perhaps hidden cameras, that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm not going to dwell on any of that. But we, we could see that Budanov is setting himself up and is being set up in this Financial Times article as the man who's going to turn everything round. He's able to project a mood of confidence and optimism. The Russians are running out of equipment. They're running out of men. They're running out of ammunition. They're running out of equipment. Um, they're now having to rely entirely on the North Koreans to keep their um, army supplied with shells. That's something else he basically says in the Financial Times article. He's somebody who's been able to revitalize Ukrainian military intelligence. He's um, a person who is regarded with cult status by Ukrainians. It's all, a frankly, rather unconvincing, even the interviewer of the Financial Times, it's clear, is not wholly convinced. But it's a rather unconvincing attempt to build up um, Budanov into some kind of heroic figure. Perhaps even the darkened room is a prop to make that, to, you know, to enhance the air of mystery around the man. And, well, it does look to me very much as if this is all being done to prepare us for his appointment as chief of chief of staff and overall military commander. Now, let me say straight away that if it is indeed Budanov who is going to be replacing Zaluzhny, assuming that Zaluzhny is indeed being sacked, then the, the situation is actually not just bad on the Ukrainian battlefields, it is catastrophic. And Budanov's appointment is likely to make it even worse. Because, as I said before, even the Financial Times elliptically is admitting that Budanov has no command experience. He's never commanded men in battle. He's never commanded brigades or divisions or army groups or anything like that. He is a special forces officer addicted to James Bond operations behind Russian lines, which he has conducted very aggressively over the course of this fighting to no significant or actual effect in terms of the course of the war, though he has caused a lot of anger and um, distress in Russia, <coughs> including amongst the families of people whom he has had killed. But anyway, so what would be the purpose, therefore, of appointing a person like this to the to this particular post? Why not appoint someone else, like General Sirsky, who is the ground forces commander, or General Tarnavsky, who is the commander of Ukrainian forces in the south? Why not appoint a real general, somebody with command experience to take charge? of the Ukrainian military at this time, if it is indeed Budanov 
who is going to be appointed to the role. As I have said before, it is Buddha, because Budanov is a ideological soldier. He is somebody who is clearly hugely committed to Project Ukraine, to Ukraine, and to the defense of Ukraine. He is staunchly opposed to any concession to the Russians. He is the endless supplier of good news. The Russians are short of men, short of equipment. They can't sustain the war for very long. And Putin has got cancer or is ill with some mysterious medical condition. And all the people that you're seeing who look like Putin on Russian television, they're not really Putin at all. They're someone else. They're clones or um, doubles or that kind of thing. So he's reliable, politically reliable, and of course, as a specialist in special operations, and as somebody who has shown great ruthlessness in the performance of them, he is the kind of person who can be relied upon to keep watch, to apply surveillance, spying on the various generals and other officers, and to hold them in line and to avert a possible coup attempt. If he is appointed to Zaluzhny's post, that would be the only explanation for why indeed he has been appointed to that post. As I said in a recent programme, he would not really be a replacement for Zaluzhny, who for all his limitations is an actual combat soldier with command experience. He would be, in effect, a political commissar. Budanov would be a political commissar appointed in order to keep the military in line. In effect, it would be another admission of how bad the relations between the military and the civilian authorities in Kiev has become and the extent to which the civilian authorities no longer trust the military and see the military as a threat to themselves. Now, if that happens, well, I think it's all but inconceivable that the military commanders, people like Tarnavsky and Sirsky and all of the others, are going to look upon Budanov's appointment with any sort of favour. They probably will be furious that a person like that has been appointed to take charge of the war. We will probably see even more eccentric and bizarre decisions being implemented by the Ukrainian command. Zelensky, uh, Zelensky will be free to give further strange orders to the Ukrainian military in the knowledge that Budanov will not only insist on implementing those orders, but that he will be in a position to make sure that officers who don't implement the orders will find themselves in severe difficulties. And, well, I can't see how that can possibly have any conceivable good outcomes. And of course, the other purpose of appointing Budanov is the one that he is talking about. It is intended to facilitate this mobilization of 500,000 troops into the Ukrainian military. This is known across Ukraine to be a deeply unpopular measure. So again, you put a security chief in charge of the whole operation and hope that his agency and that of the SBU will be enough to contain whatever protests or unrest that generates. Incidentally, whilst talking about Budanov's appointment and also um, Zaluzhny's potential dismissal, there is an 
another very odd fact about this interview, which is that Zaluzhny himself, the overall commander and chief of staff, is never actually named in it. I could not find a single reference to um, Zaluzhny anywhere in this um, interview, um, in this entire article, and I'm sure that there is, in fact, no such reference. In fact, when discussing the mobilization, Budanov has this to say, Zelensky has said his army chiefs asked him to mobilize about 400 to 500,000 new soldiers to represent those killed, to replace those killed and wounded, and to rest those involved in the most intense fighting. Well, his army chiefs, army chiefs, Ukraine's army chiefs, seems to me a way of evading, avoiding reference to Zaluzhny himself by name. Because, of course, when Zelensky first announced the call-up, he claimed that it was Zaluzhny who had asked him to do it. And, well, anyway, the fact that Zaluzhny's name is omitted from this whole article strongly suggests to me that he is indeed in line for being sacked. So, anyway, let's see what happens. Uh, uh, we should probably know at some point over the next couple of days. I, do, I should stress, I don't think, even if Zelensky has indeed made this decision and has communicated it to Zeluzhny, even if he has indeed formally sacked Zeluzhny and appointed Budanov to that position, or at least said that he has, I don't think it is necessarily a done thing. The ground force, the other military commanders, might be extremely unhappy to have someone like Budanov appointed to take charge. They might uh, rally to Zaluzhny. There might be an intensifying struggle within the uh, Ukrainian leadership. Zaluzhny might refuse to cede control. We'll see what happens. But anyway, to all appearances, this appears to be the plan. Sack Zaluzhny, replace him with Budanov. We'll see whether or not it is, it is successfully carried through. And this article in the Financial Times, to my mind, provides a kind of ellipti elliptical confirmation that it is indeed the plan and that, that it is what... Um, Zelensky at least wants to do. Well, a catastrophic situation in every respect. And as I said, catastrophic on the battlefronts, situation going from bad to worse on the battlefronts, and uh, with no sign of it being turned round any point soon. And a possible power struggle continuing in Kiev, rumours swirling of Zaluzhny's dismissal and of Budanov's appointment. If that is carried through, it will make the situation, in the end, worse still, because it will put a person in charge who is unfit for this role and will simply increase the mistrust between the civilians and the military and highlight it. And if it isn't carried through, a sign that the position of the political leadership of Zelensky himself is weakening still further. A grave situation indeed. One wonders to what extent the United States is involved in all of this and is participating in it. The fact that this interview with Budanov has appeared in the Financial Times suggests that someone 
in the West, in London or in Washington, has come round to Zelensky's perspective and has decided that Zeluzhny must go. I personally think that Zeluzhny himself is an over-promoted over and overrated officer. I will discuss that further in another programme. But one way or the other, overall situation in Ukraine becoming going from bad to worse. And it does make all of these discussions in the West about sending more financial aid to Ukraine, trying to find more shells to send to Ukraine. An EU commissioner said that the European Union is now looking to supply Ukraine with 1.4 million shells by the end of this year. I don't think anybody in Ukraine will take that particularly seriously, by the way. But anyway, all of those deteriorating situation in Ukraine, reports that Ukraine is now finding it is running out of drones. Zelensky mentioned this the other day. Reports that the Russians are becoming more effective at jamming Ukrainian drones, including FPV drones. I already said this was likely to happen. As I said, all of those debates about seizing Russian assets, um, going on, uh, uh, strong arming Congress into uh, providing more money for Project Ukraine. Um, all of the attempts to bully the Slovaks and the Hungarians to agree to the EU providing more money to Ukraine, all of these clever schemes to get round the opposition of the Hungarians and the Slovaks, um, repeated, reiterated by Slovakia's Prime Minister Robert Fico, who is apparently preparing for a rather difficult meeting with the, with the Ukrainian Prime Minister, Mr. Schmigal. Anyway, uh, all of this, I have to say, starting to look in terms of the actual course of the war, increasingly irrelevant, given what we're hearing from the battlefronts. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about the situation in Ukraine today. There's been dramatic news from the Middle East and it does seem to me that we are now well en route to a further, to a further uh, military conflict. The United States, as I've said already, now seems to be regularly launching missile and airstrikes against the Houthis. And there are reports that the United States is now trying to come up with some kind of long-term plan to battle the Houthis. It's not clear what form this plan is going to take um, deployment of US ground troops to Yemen would be a disastrous idea. I can't imagine the Pentagon will agree. And I think the Democratic Party leadership would be horrified if any such thing was proposed during a presidential election year. But anyway, the United States committed to long term operations, apparently against the Houthis, who continue, of course, to strike at commercial shipping in the Red Sea. The attacks on the Houthis are not achieving their stated purpose. And we have um, the Israelis launching attacks, killing officers of the Iranian, of the, of the Iran, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Missile strikes by Israel on Damascus, um, attacks on targets in Lebanon. And then on top of that, we've now had reports of a massive attack on the United States' al-Assad base in Iraq. And the reports say that this attack was carried out by ballistic missiles launched apparently from within Iraq, which is remarkable. And apparently the base has um, elaborate air defenses based around the Patriot missile system. But apparently several of these missiles got through. And well, we're not getting very clear reports 
about how many people were injured or killed as a result of these attacks. But anyway, an attack of some kind on Allah, the Al-Assad base does seem to have taken place. And in parenthesis, we've been hearing a great deal about the enormous success of the Patriot system in Ukraine. We're hearing less of that, by the way, recently, now that it's becoming increasingly clear that the Patriot missiles are not, in fact, able to withstand Russian missile attacks. But note that American sources are now conceding that the Patriot missiles were unable to shoot down all of the ballistic missiles that were launched at this particular base in Iraq. Now, who would have launched this attack? Well, if the missiles were launched from inside Iraq, then obviously it must have been done by one of the various local militias that operate inside Iraq. But it is difficult to believe that a militia by itself would be in a position to develop um, missiles, ballistic missiles, would have the capability to develop and build ballistic missiles with the necessary accuracy to carry out an attack like this. And one has to conclude that the attack must have had the backing at some level of Iran. That the Iranians, in other words, have been providing ballistic missiles to some of their uh, militia allies in Iraq in order to give themselves some degree of deniability that they're directly involved and that they're they but that they were ultimately behind this attack on this base and it was at one of the bases by the way that Iran has previously attacked um, in response to the American assassination of the uh, um, commander the former commander of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, General Soleimani, some years ago when Donald Trump was president. So anyway, missile strike on an American base. We have not yet been given details of casualties, but it does seem that at least some American soldiers have been injured. And of course, a ballistic missile strike like this will be very unsettling. Again, I think that this is intended more as a warning than as a concerted attack on the base. The Iranians, again, are signaling to the United States that if the United States is foolish enough to launch a military strike on Iran, then Iran will retaliate. It has the capability to do so. And despite the presence of Patriot missile interceptors and defences, Iranian ballistic missiles have both the accuracy to strike targets and the capability to get through the American air defence systems. We've now had exchanges of missile and airstrikes between Iran and Pakistan. We've had the killing by Israel of officers of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. We've had American airstrikes on the Houthis, who are allies of Iran. And we've had Iranian counter-strikes, Iranian strikes on um, bases in you know, of anti-Iranian bases, let's put it like this. It's not entirely clear whose bases were attacked. Bases near Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan. And we've now had a further missile strike, this time against an American base. Apparently, apparently it's a huge sprawling complex. And once more, it seems that whoever was behind the attack, was careful to try and avoid killing 
Americans in large numbers. Um, it doesn't seem as if the barracks, for example, of the American soldiers were specifically targeted. But anyway, a missile strike on an American base highlighting the weakness and inadequacy of American air defences and anti-missile defences. Now, all of this, to my mind, points clearly to a deteriorating military picture. And um, Iranian apprehensions that the United States is drifting into a situation where it is not only going to be involved in a long war against the Houthis in Yemen, a war which even the president himself, Joe Biden, has sort of admitted cannot achieve the stated objective of preventing Houthi attacks on merchant shipping in the Red Sea, but also ultimately and logically an attack on Iran itself. Now, anybody who says that this is not, that this is, we're not heading in that direction, I think is simply not noticing this pattern of attacks and counterattacks, st strikes and counterstrikes that is now taking place in the Middle East. We haven't reached that point yet. Diplomatic action, in theory, could stop this. But I'm starting to think that the momentum is now inexorable. The United States is already talking about a long war against the Houthis in Yemen. So already we see the United States committed to a long war in the Middle East, another long war in the Middle East. And given, as I said, all of the political and geostrategic pressures, I have to say this, I think that a conflict between Iran and the United States is getting closer now by the day. It would be a disastrous outcome, one I fervently hope we can avoid, but it seems to me that all the signs clearly point to it. And it's dismaying, again, how little real pushback or discussion there is about all of these various moves and counter moves in the United States that no one seems to be prepared to come forward and point to how dangerous the situation is becoming and say, for heaven's sake, let's stop. Well, that at least is my assessment and we shall see. Now, earlier in the programme, I said that I would mention that the Ukrainians, um, even as the situation in Avdevka and other places is deteriorating, have also launched another um, artillery strike on Donetsk city. There are reports that up to 13 people were killed, and there are also reports that the target was a market. Now, this is particularly poignant for me because I can remember during the Yugoslav Wars that there was an attack, an artillery attack, on a market in Sarajevo, been controversy as to who was responsible, which I'm not going to explore. But I remember the galvanizing effect that had in the West in persuading people there to basically take strong action against Yugoslavia. And indeed, eventually that action was taken. Now, the Russians are not going to respond to this attack on the marketplace in the same way. Why should they? They're war they are winning the war. But it is eerie to me, again, how these reports get almost no attention in the West. A market bombing in Sarajevo is big news. A market bombing in Donetsk apparently is not. Well, perhaps none of us should be surprised about this. 
Now, coming back to the situation in the Middle East, if we are heading towards a big war in the Middle East, given the need for Patriot, more Patriot in interceptors in the Middle East to try to provide at least some protection from these Iranian missile strikes, one does wonder how Jake Sullivan and Avril Haynes really think that the United States can provide more air defense systems to Ukraine. And as they apparently said to Congress that the United States needed to do. And if there are going to be fewer air defense missiles or perhaps no air defense missiles supplied to Ukraine, setting aside ethical issues, Surely, the United States ought to be telling the Ukrainians to stop these attacks on Donetsk City. They could invite Russian retaliation. And with the scale of the commitments that the United States is now facing, It's not impossible that if that retaliation from the Russians come, that Ukraine will lack air defense systems to protect against it. Anyway, that is another reason I would have thought for trying to avoid a big war in the Middle East. But as I said, all the clues, all the suggestions point to it coming. An altogether grim picture and we're still in January in 2024. I wonder what the rest of the year will bring. I can't say that I look forward to it with any optimism, but we shall just have to wait and see. Anyway, this is where I finish my programme today. More from me soon. Um, I'll be doing uh, more programmes, obviously, tomorrow, bring you up to date with the situation in Avdevka and other places with the deteriorating situation in the Middle East. In the meantime, all that is left is for me to, again, wish you um, all a good day, remind you that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X, that you can um, support our work via Patreon and subscribe star, links under this video. You can also check out our shop and buy yourself the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.